please do keep praying for it. Well, make sure you've got your Bibles open as we continue to get into Genesis 8 and 9. We want to be looking at Genesis 8 there. And a few weeks back, our family went to visit a friend at a Christian rehab center. Uh, if you've been to, this is one's out in the country, it was really actually quite lovely. There's a, there's a bunch of women there who are recovering from various addictions to alcohol and drugs. And it's so encouraging, actually, to see the work that God is doing in their lives. It's a Christian rehab center, and they're growing in Christ. It's really wonderful to see. But they have a small farm, and our girls really wanted to pat the cows. And so one of the young women there took us up onto a hillside with some feed, uh, and the girls got to pat the cows. And I was chatting with this young woman as, as we went along. And she was sharing some of her story and how she had been in and out of rehab before. And she said that before she came into this center, her, her father said to her, this is your last chance. This is your last chance. Now, I can't imagine the pain that family has been through, so I can't judge whether that was a wise thing to say or not. But what we see in this passage, Genesis 8 and 9, is that God is unbelievably slow to utter words like that. We are given billions of chances every single day. Now, what we see in this passage is God's incredible mercy despite ongoing human failure. And those will be our two headings for this morning. Our first heading is God's incredible mercy. And I want you to put yourself in Noah's sandals as you're stepping off the ark. Remember last week, Paul told us that Noah was in the ark for one year and 10 days. He compared it to those Aussies who were rescued in Indonesia recently, who are out on the open ocean for 36 hours, including two nights at sea. You think of their joy when they put their feet on solid ground again. And now think of Noah and his family's joy after one year and ten days. They would have been ecstatic. They've made it through this terrible flood, and it seems like they're entering into a brand new creation. Uh, Paul, last week, mentioned the parallels with Adam, and we see some of them here again. Chapter 9, verse 1, if you look at it, God blessing Noah and his sons and telling them to be fruitful and multiply. It sounds like a new Eden, But if we zoom in closer on this picture, we'll see that there are some blemishes. Chapter 8, verse 21, the human heart is still evil, like before the flood. Chapter 9, verse 2, there's fear. Verse 6, there's bloodshed. This is not a new Eden. Noah took sin onto the ark with him. Actually, he took sin onto the ark in him. And so I wonder, as well as being excited as they got out of the ark, I I wonder if they also felt some trepidation. They've witnessed God's judgment firsthand. And so perhaps getting off the ark would have been like not walking into a ghost town, but a ghost planet. And maybe they were afraid they'd muck it up again and bring another flood to wash them away. Well, in these verses, God is so gracious to put those fears to rest. And the first thing God provides is restraint. If you, if you look at chapter 8, verse 20, as Noah gets off the ark, he builds an altar and sacrifices some animals. Now, you, you remember that when Noah took the animals onto the ark, he took two pairs of unclean animals and, he, sorry, a pair of each unclean animal and seven pairs of the clean animals. And so he's sacrificing some of the clean animals here and they must have felt a bit ripped off after surviving the flood, only to be sacrificed on land for. But the reason Noah sacrificed was because he knew it was only because of God's mercy that he came through the flood. And so the most fitting thing to do is to stop and worship the Lord. And it uses language of a burnt offering in verse 20. You might know that in Leviticus, the burnt offering is performed to forgive sin. It's like at this point, Noah steps off the ark and he says, I'm sorry, God. We're sorry. I'm sorry for everything I've done, we've done, we've made a mess of this world. And we see the result of this offering in verse 21. If you look down at it with me, it's, it's actually quite astonishing. It says, when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, Summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. 
It's an amazing promise of restraint on God's behalf. Noah's sacrifices it changes everything. That the threat of God's terrible judgment, it's gone. Even though humanity hasn't changed since before the flood. Even though, verse 21, the intention of man's heart is still evil from his youth. It's the same diagnosis of the human heart that we had before the flood. Chapter 6, verse 5. What Mickey said the other week about original sin. It was in Noah too. It's in us. One of the theologians has said that human sin deserves a daily deluge. But here, God promises he won't. He will restrain his righteous anger against sin as long as the earth remains. And it's not just that. It's the promise of the continuance of the normal rhythms of life. Verse 22, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter. We take them all for granted, but the only reason we can is because God has made this promise to Noah. This is the foundation for science, that there are God-given regularities in this world that we can study. And it's the reason that we can be confident that the world isn't going to suddenly end at the hands of humans. Now, there are many people who believe that humans will destroy the planet. I was reading a commentary on this passage, and, and it was talking about the anxiety of young people, how they think the world is going to end because of what humans are doing, and there's no point having children when they're just doomed to catastrophe. And we all know what they're talking about. Actually, maybe we don't. This commentary was from quite a few decades ago, and so it wasn't talking about climate change. It was talking about the danger of the Soviet Union causing a nuclear catastrophe to end the world. But if we believe in verse 22, it will be a great comfort to us. It will relieve us from the anxiety of human-induced cataclysm. This isn't to say that we shouldn't care about nuclear weapons or about the environment, but we should take great comfort when we trust that this earth is on God's timetable and not man's. In chapter 9, verses 1 to 7, God provides restraint not on himself, but on us by giving us laws and boundaries. Like I said, chapter 9, verse 1 is very familiar. It's repeating the command to Adam. God's saying, get on with the baby making and prosper on this planet that I've given to you. He still lovingly and graciously wants to fill this earth with his image bearers. It's a very generous command to give. In verse 2, we see another contrast with Adam. Whereas God brought the animals to be named by Adam, here God says the animals are going to be afraid of Noah. And whereas Adam was only given plant plants to eat, God warms up the barbecue. And he says, you can have meat now. In verse 4, God puts a limit on eating meat. He says, you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. There's a bit of confusion about what this means, and I, I won't say it's completely clear. Some think it's health reasons. It's not saying you can't have your steak on the rare side. Uh, it, I, I think it's saying just don't be a savage. Don't pick, up, pick an animal up off the ground and eat it like you would pick an apple off a tree. There's something special and significant about blood in the Bible. When the, when the blood is pumping, whether in an animal or a human, then that thing is alive. And that's why the Bible says that the life is in the blood. And God's saying, don't eat an animal that still has its blood pumping. Don't be like a lion where you just eat it alive. And I want us to notice that there's a respect for animal life in that. Even though the animals are given into our hands here, there is still this respect that we're to have towards them. The next restraint on humans, and perhaps the most significant, is in verse 6. Look at verse 6 with me. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. It's saying that human life is so valuable and so precious that to take another person's life is to forfeit your own. Now, I understand that Christians hold different views on capital punishment this side of the cross. Uh, my personal view is that it is legitimate for the state to execute murderers under certain conditions. But I understand there are Christians of good faith who disagree. The big point is that human life is precious. If you kill a human, you've killed a divine image bearer. And that is deadly serious. One other thing to notice here is that humans are still created in the image of God. 
Some people have the wrong idea that after the fall, it erased the image of God in humans. But this is clear. Even though we are fallen, even though we are broken in so many ways, this makes it clear that every human being is still made in God's image and so is still worthy of dignity and respect. And so God is incredibly merciful here, how he restrains his own judgment and he restrains human evil. He's also incredibly merciful by providing the rainbow. If you look at verses 9 and 10, it's about as comprehensive as possible, God's promise with the rainbow. It's not just for Noah. It's not just for the people of Israel. No, this is for every human being and every creature who ever lives. And this is why theologians call this common grace. It's common grace in contrast to particular grace. Uh, There is particular saving grace that God shows to his people Israel and to those who are in Christ. What we have in verses 9 and 10 is common grace because it's common to all of humanity. Everyone benefits from this gracious rainbow promise of God not to send the flood again. It's like what we read in our second reading. God sends his sunshine on the good and on the evil. It's not just that maybe only Christians get sunshine on their farms. No, everyone. God gives his sunshine to everyone on the planet. That's common grace. In verse 11, the promise is called a covenant. And remember, a covenant is a solemn promise. It's like the marriage promises. God's making a solemn promise not to flood the earth again. And he gives the sign of the covenant in verse 12. Have a look at verse 12. It says, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Now, Mickey mentioned a few weeks ago how we infantilize the story of Noah. And so we think of a rainbow here and we think of children's books and rainbows and unicorns. But, but like Paul said, like Paul said before, it, it actually doesn't say rainbow in the text. It says a bow. So we shouldn't think of rainbows and unicorns. We should think of bows and arrows. So the bow in the sky, it's a weapon of war. Like Paul said, what we have here is God hanging up his weapon of war. He says, I'm hanging up my bow. The rainbow is a sign that God, yes, he is deadly serious about sin. It remembers the flood that he has righteously judged sin before. But it's a sign that he's mercifully holding holding back his judgment for now. He's hung up his bow. And Charles Spurgeon very helpfully noted that if you look at the rainbow in the sky and you imagine notching an arrow in it, the arrow wouldn't be pointing down at us. It would be pointing up at the heavens. Because ultimately, it's God who will take the punishment. Ultimately, it's Jesus who will take the arrow of divine wrath against us. So we've seen God's incredible mercy in providing restraint and the rainbow. And that's our first point. Remember, what we're seeing here this morning is God's incredible mercy despite ongoing human failure. And that's our second point now, ongoing human failure. As we look at this dark story of Noah and his sons from verse 18, we can see that nothing has changed. Sin really is still in every human heart. So in verses 18 and 19, we're given the names of Noah's sons. And then in verse 20, look at it with me. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. So far, so good. He's getting on with cultivating the earth. That's great. But verse 21 is devastating. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. So here's Noah. For the past four chapters, chapter 6 to 9, longest part of the Bible so far dedicated to one man, Noah, this paragon really of, of humanity. He, he's a tower of righteousness. Every, every point it mentions what he does, it says he, commanded, he, he did what the law, Lord commanded him to do. Here's Noah. Just like Adam and Eve, naked and ashamed in chapter 3, Noah is naked and shameful, drunk and dribbling in his tent. 
terrible. It's ongoing human failure. If we thought the flood would put a stop to human sin, well, we're relieved of that delusion here. And then we see the different responses of Noah's sons. If you look at verse 22 with me, it says, And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward and they did not see their father's nakedness. Now this seems like a strange story to us. I don't know if anyone here has had to do it before. (laughs) But the point is that Ham's reaction to his father's shame isn't to help him. It's to gossip about him to his brothers. It's not to help him. It's It's to amplify Noah's shame. It's actually to severely dishonor his father. Shem and Japheth do what Ham should have done, which is to lovingly cover the shame of their father. Noah wakes up in verse 24, and in verses 25 to 27, Noah pronounces curses and blessings. And if you're familiar with the book of Genesis, it kind of follows a pattern that we're going to see with uh, Isaac and with Jacob a bit later on, these curses and blessings for children. In verse 25, we see a curse pronounced on Canaan, and we'll see the curse comes true. If you look at the descendants of Canaan in chapter 10, it's like a villain's lineup of the Old Testament. And this is the tragedy. Do you remember how there were, that there were two lines of ancestry that, that came out of Adam and Eve? There was the, the godly line of Seth, and then there was the ungodly line of Cain. And, and do you remember how they, they matched the promise of Genesis 3.15? Remember God's promise to send a serpent crusher and there was the offspring of the woman and the offspring of the serpent? They were matching that. And, and maybe we thought with the flood, maybe we'd be, be tempted to think that we're done with that serpent's line of Cain. It's over. We've washed things up. Here we see the serpent's line continue. Just this time, it's not through Cain, it's through Canaan. And the account of Noah closes with verses 28 and 29. And it's it's jarring, really, after all this hope with this righteous man of God. Remember, he came in in at the end of chapter 5 after that steamroller of death through chapter 5, and he died, and he died, and he died here. Chapter 6, verse 29, all the days of Noah were 950 years And he died. Noah is just like his father. He's just like his sons. He died. The same enemy that comes for us all. So we've seen God's incredible mercy despite ongoing human failure. And I think as we come to the end of this story of Noah, this this towering figure of human history... Really what we need to do is, every morning we we wake up, it's a new day, we need to stop and give thanks and praise to God that we're not waking up underwater. Because our sin really does deserve a daily deluge. God is so kind and patient and merciful towards us. Each tick of the clock, each breath we take, each moment of life, It's a reason to give thanks to God. You think of this young woman in the rehab center being told, this is your last chance. And you think of the front page of our newspapers and you go, man, God really does give billions of chances every single day, doesn't he? You might have read this week of the English nurse found guilty of murdering babies on her ward. This woman who was meant to care for these babies who were delivered billions of chances every single day. You know, you read about this terrible chief of Wagner, this paramilitary group. He's a a mass murderer. He's he's plane suddenly, mysteriously falling from the sky. Billions of chances every single day. You read another article about how in Australia theft is increasing, you know, in the retail shops. Billions of chances every single day. This world is mucked up, and yet how incredibly merciful is God despite our corruption and violence and sin? And 
and it doesn't cover the private stuff, the, thing, the, the stuff we think we can cover up. Maybe like Noah thought he could in his tent. And for some of us, it might be literally the same as Noah, literally drunk and dribbling. You know, we do it when we think no one else will notice. But nothing is hidden from God. See, human sin has survived the flood. But also, notice at the end of the passage that not only did the new serpent's line of Canaan survive, we also had the line of Shem. In Noah's oracle, Shem receives the highest blessing. Japheth will dwell in his tents. And you might know that Shem is where we get the word Semite from. Or if you've heard that word, anti-Semitism, to do with hating Jewish people. Because the Jewish line traces from Shem. As we read through the Bible, we follow that line from Shem, through Abraham, through David, down to Jesus. It's the true... Jesus is the true human. Where we have this ongoing failure, he's the true human who doesn't fail. Never failed. Who didn't sin where we sin. Who took the deluge that we deserve. Ultimately, it's through Shem, Abraham, David, it's through Jesus that we find the greatest mercy despite our ongoing failure. Let's give thanks to God for Jesus now. Our Father in heaven, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. As we um, see that, that sin, it just keeps going through, We see it in our own lives, billions of chances every single day. We thank you for Jesus, the one who who actually lived a righteous life. Father, we thank you and praise you for this promise to Noah, which meant the world has kept going until we had a chance to come to know Christ. Father, we thank you that we don't wake up each morning underwater. Thank you for your patience and mercy towards us. In Jesus' name, amen.